Professor John William McDonald Agar, who prefers to be called John, graduated from Monash University Medical School in 1970 and trained in nephrology in Melbourne and UMass Medical School in Worcester, USA in 1978, returned to his home city of Geelong, where he established and ran a clinical nephrology practice until his retirement in February 2020. John has published more than 250 peer-reviewed papers and abstracts, four book chapters, two dialysis-related books, one with me, and more than 90 Kidney Views blogs as the hemodialysis advisor and internet consultant to the Wisconsin-based Medical Education Institute since 2010. John has been an invited lecturer on dialysis topics in 16 countries, especially on his three pet topics, nocturnal home hemodialysis, extended hour and higher frequency hemodialysis, and environmental sustainability in dialysis and nephrology, founding the global concepts of green dialysis and green nephrology. Among his awards for contributions in nephrology are the Order of Australia Medal, Australia's highest honor, the Priscilla Kincaid Smith Medal, and the International Society of Hemodialysis Zbilut Twardowski Lifetime Achievement Award in Hemodialysis. For those of you who have just joined today, this is actually the third in a series of, I think, 11 uh, of these that we have um, uh, prepared. Uh, they're approximately an hour each. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, they are um, uh, designed in order. So uh, those who've missed the first two um, will have kind of missed a little bit of the introductory stuff that uh, I will expand on as we go through this one. But uh, I think that they are available now through Home Dialysis Central uh, and their website. So you can go back and look at these and play them again in your own time as uh, essentially YouTube videos. Uh, I'm going to just now pull up my presentation here. Okay, today I'm gonna to talk about what makes um, dialysis, uh, or what makes for good dialysis. Uh, and I'm gonna talk mainly about options in time and frequency. Now, as I said before, uh, some of this has been covered in previous presentations. Uh, most of these are adapted from Kidney View blog posts of some of the 90-odd that I've given. Uh, I've uh, reconstructed as slide presentations and slide sets, and that's the genesis of most of these uh, slide presentations. Uh, good dialysis, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is mainly about weekly membrane contact time. In other words, that means uh, how long in a given week uh, you are attached to your, uh, or you're, you're attached to your machine and that machines, uh, the blood and, and dialysate are in contact with each other. Uh, to achieve a weekly membrane contact time uh, demands uh, two things. One, uh, sufficient frequency and two, sufficient time. So a combination of frequency and time equals hours per week that you have spent on your dialysis machine. Essentially, though this is not entirely true, uh, frequency uh, is required to, um, to permit the removal of both small and large solutes, while time is what governs the safe removal of volume at a perfusion friendly rate. So I'm gonna to talk today about uh, uh, frequency in terms of solute removal and time in, in terms of volume removal. Now, those two statements are not entirely correct because obviously frequency also does permit uh, uh, added volume removal. Uh, providing that you're on the machine for long enough to be able to do that safely. And time certainly allows the removal of large solute, uh, uh, so-called middle molecules, um, more than uh, small, sol small solutes or small molecules. So both of them affect both functions, but in essence, 
frequency is solute and time is volume. Bad dialysis is what most people now endure. It's fast, it's hard, it's brutal, it's rapid turnover. And unfortunately in the United States, particularly, uh, not here, thank goodness, and hopefully never it will be, uh, but in the United States, it is for profit. And I put care in inverted commas there because the for-profit model does not sit easily and well with the concept of care. Indeed, most current dialysis uh, uh, is the very opposite of care and bad dialysis, particularly again in the United States where there is a requirement to achieve this uh, odd thing we call KTV, uh, which is a mathematical construct, uh, bad dialysis is ruled by that mathematics and by profit and not by an understanding of the principles and practices of good dialysis. Let me turn my, for a moment to KTV, which I think is a damning indictment on us. Poor dialysis has been driven by the misuse of KTV. KTV, uh, which is a uh, mathematical construct around the removal of urea, has encouraged clinicians to increase K at the, at the um, uh, uh, loss of T. Now, K essentially, not entirely true, but essentially uh, is the clearance parameters of the dialysis process. Uh, it is a construct which looks at uh, uh, the permeability of the membrane, uh, the speed at which the dialysis, the blood passes, the dialysate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you'll notice that when you have a, uh, a, a denominator, a, a, a numerator and a denominator, if the numerator is a, is a double of two things, clearance and time over a, a denominator of uh, volume, if you, in, you, you, to get the same number, K times T, you could use a high K and a little T because they are multiplying each other, or a low K and a high T. So if you, if you magnify one, you can minimize the other. And that's the difficulty and the, the error I think dialysis has made, is that we have concentrated on trying to push brutal hard K in order to reduce T. And this has consequently downplayed the influence of time. It's rather a concept of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Raising one variable and, and lowering another gives the same result. An example of that is two and times four is eight and four times two is eight. So if you raise one, you can lower the other. Then it must not matter, of course, which variable is altered. Well, that's wrong. It actually does matter which variable is altered. And what we have done is minimize time at, at the uh, sacrificed to uh, an a enlarged K. That's not how dialysis works. Each numerator variable does matter and dialysis is not a multiplication table. Short hour and low frequency hemodialysis, which is if you like conventional center-based dialysis, which is what most patients receive. And in the US commonly, for three to four, three and a half hours, three times a week, or if you like nine to 10 and a half hours of membrane contact time. Whereas if you compare in Australia and Japan, for example, Australia, New Zealand and Japan, uh, the average uh, dialysis time in a center-based patient is between four and a half and five hours times a week, which gives a significantly greater amount of weekly membrane contact time, uh, up to around about an extra half over and above that which is uh, provided in the United, United States. 
membrane contact times of nine to 10 and a half hours are not the same as membrane contact times of 13 and a half to 15. They are significantly different both in the efficiency of solute removal and in the speed of ultrafiltration. Yet the literature tends to conflate these as if they are the same. Journal articles just talk about conventional dialysis, but they often don't uh, detail the number of hours uh, of membrane contact time a week, and I think that is a significant issue in literature reports. Conventional centre-based dialysis, especially the US conventional model, allows neither sufficient time for full solute removal nor sufficient frequency for volume control. And I'll come back and talk about that again in a minute. And if you remember there, I have actually changed those around. And I've done that on purpose. Because remember before I was talking about time being volume and frequency being solute, I did also say that they both influence each other. And the turnaround uh, uh, alters the effect of both. There is a false seduction in uh, shortening dialysis time. A short dialysis treatment provides apparent adequate cleansing of small solutes like urea. That we use this uh, term, uh, KTV urea, which is a mathematical model based on the clearance of urea and urea alone. But there are other more insidious molecules that are not well removed and they take time for their removal. They re require a much longer time to be adequately taken away. So duration matters, time matters. Let's turn for a moment to look at small molecular weight solute removal. Now, we've talked about this on, pr on previous um, uh, sessions here, but I'm going to go through it again. And I'm sorry for those who've heard me do this before, because I think it really is, it matters. This is the, the basis of how uh, dialysis works. You'll notice that on this axis here, this is the amount to be removed any substance, put urea, potassium, creatinine, beta-2 microglobulin, it doesn't really matter. The amount is removed over time is on this axis. And this is the time you have to do it. Two hours of dialysis, four hours of dialysis, six and eight. You'll notice that as time passes through the first two hours of dialysis, the amount of substance removed continually rises, but it doesn't rise in a straight line. It rises in a slowly curving downward fashion because the more removed, the smaller the gradient between the uh, blood compartment, the blood solute level and the dialysis fluid level and the slower the removal of the substance becomes. So in the first two hours, we remo remove quite a lot of substance. But in the next two hours, we remove much less. And note, it is, this is the amount removed, the area under the curve. It's not this bit now, it's only that little bit. So first two hours, lots removed. Second two hours, less. Third two hours, less again. And the final two hours, if you're doing a six to eight hour run, uh, we're removing very little additional solute. So somebody who's on nocturnal dialysis will think, well, where's the benefit in that? I'm doing an extra uh, two hours and I'm removing uh, damn all extra uh, solute for that, uh, for that extra two hours that I've uh, stayed on the machine. In terms of small, small solute removal, Longer dialysis, like nocturnal dialysis, really doesn't uh, uh, add a great deal. But good dialysis is far more than uh, just small solute removal. Indeed, solutes are manied and varied, and many are not small at all. And I show this, take a breath. These are some of the water, some of 
the water soluble solutes that we remove. And you'll notice that there's only two or three here that you are familiar with, creatinine, urea, uric acid, perhaps. The rest of these are names that you probably have never heard of, but they are indeed freeze water soluble, small waste solutes that are removed on dialysis. Middle molecules, we, these are bigger size molecules, and two that you might uh, be familiar with, a parathyroid hormone and beta-2 microglobulin, a macroglobulin, microglobulin that should be, sorry, um, uh, and uh, protein-bound uh, solutes like homocysteine, which are not easily removed by dialysis at all, except perhaps by peritoneal dialysis or very long, slow uh, hemodialysis. As I said, some of these you'll have heard of, uh, others uh, uh, unf you'll be unfamiliar with. And you kind of thought solutes were easy. Well, this shows you that solutes are far from easy. Let's turn now to the middle molecular weight solute removal. This behaves differently. That's the crux. Middle molecules behave differently. They do not... Con uh, uh, um, uh, are not removed down a concentration gradient as perhaps potassium or urea or um, uh, creatinine are, but they are removed by, down a, uh, a linear gradient uh, which revolves around the concept of time. So in the first two hours, you remove that much. In the second two hours, you remove the same amount. In the third two hours, you, rem you again remove the same amount. So here you see the benefit for somebody who is doing long, slow dialysis. They are removing much more middle molecule than they would if they're only doing two, uh, uh, two to four hours of dialysis uh, per run. So here for middle molecular weight removal, Time is absolutely crucial. Again, if you look at that horrendous list, you may now understand that the removal of urea and the, the hopelessly naive use of urea as KTV and the yardstick of good dialysis is just that. It is naive and uh, it is just bunkum, to be honest. So it's time we moved away from using uh, uh, yardsticks like uh, KTV uh, and thought of dialysis in a more holistic way uh, where it removes a range of different substances. So this is why middle molecular weight solutes are not well removed by short hour dialysis. And you'll notice that I did talk about micro beta 2 microglobulin, but I, I kind of glossed over the fact that phosphate behaves like a middle molecule. Now, uh, uh, many solutes can't be hurried in, in their time to remove. Now, phosphate's a weird little uh, substance because uh, phosphate looks small. So phosphate uh, is PO4. So it's phosphate with four oxygen molecules attached to it. But that phosphate uh, att attracts water around it. So there is, uh, to the dialysis membrane, phosphate looks huge, but to the trained eye, untrained eye, phosphate looks small. Because phosphate surrounds itself with a water envelope, and this makes it behave as if it was much larger. And phosphate, in fact, it's quite hard for phosphate to cross a dialysis membrane, despite the fact that it looks like it's a small molecule to begin with. And then we come to something like beta-2 microglobulin. Why should we worry? Well, beta-2 microglobulin is a middle molecule. Uh, it controls hepcidin function, which is a key regulator in iron metabolism. It plays a regulator role in the immune system. And in patients who are on long-term dialysis, it causes amyloid fibers to accumulate in joint spaces and causes a condition known as uh, amyloidosis. Finally, it needs time or a, a leaky dialysis uh, membrane for its adequate removal. 
So these are substances that need time. So we're going to have a coffee break there. So people can stretch their legs for a minute. Uh, Dory, do you want to ask if anybody's got any questions at this stage or would I get, just keep going? Stephen has a question. He said he's curious as to what blood pump speeds Dr. Agar considers fast or slow. He's doing eight and a half hours at 220. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. He said slower yeah. than when I was doing three hours at 350. Absolutely wonderful, Stephen. Uh, uh, you're going just fine. Uh, our nocturnal patients, which uh, are on for, who are on for usually uh, eight hours, between seven and nine hours, but we'll say eight as an average, uh, they run their, uh, our mean bl blood speed is about 225. Um, and that's all you need. You don't need to rush your blood past the dialysate. Uh, in fact, there are some benefits in not doing so, and certainly to the benefit of your fistula, to run a slower blood flow rate. So, uh, uh, but obviously in somebody who is doing two hours or two and a half hours or three hours uh, of dialysis, uh, that's where the blood uh, pump speed tends to get turned up uh, to cut back on the need for tea or for time. Uh, but in so doing, uh, you're flogging the fistula. You're really doing uh, significant damage and um, uh, 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 long-term effects on fistula function. And one of our slide sets coming up, uh, Dory, I think you'll find is uh, don't flog the fistula or something similar to that. I can't remember the name we've given it, uh, but that will be about number six or seven in the um, 11 series, I think. Is that right, Dory? I would have to look that up. <laughs> it is about it's it's in that range somewhere yeah. about it's somewhere in the middle of the of the se of the session Excellent. of the group. All right, I'm going to go on now. So we've looked at the false seduction of um, uh, uh, shortened dialysis time uh, in the first instance. This is the second way uh, that a uh, shortened dialysis time uh, has a major effect on the efficacy and safety, and here now particularly safety of uh, the dialysis process. Because if you um, shorten the dialysis time, you have the, the patient who's gained a certain amount of volume of weight gain, excess fluid, call it what you like, from the end of one dialysis to the next. Now, some patients who still pass urine uh, don't have that uh, difficulty, but the majority of patients who are on dialysis, uh, their urine output drops away, and uh, many, if not the majority of patients uh, on dialysis pass little or no urine. And that means that anything they drink will stay inside the body until the next dialysis session. That means that you have to remove that amount of fluid in the next dialysis session to bring that patient back to fluid uh, uh, or circulatory volume neutrality, uh, where the blood volume is, it, to use a simple term, normal. Now, applying an ultrafiltration rate that is too fast will cause uh, uh, circulatory instability, it will cause the blood pressure to be unstable and fall, it will cause cramp, and we have a session uh, devoted, I think, to cramp in one of the uh, upcoming uh, slide sets. Uh, it will induce nausea and vomiting, and of all, it will stimulate thirst. And I'm gonna come back to the concept of thirst later in this session. A rapid ultrafiltration rate also causes stunning of vital organs, in particularly the heart and the brain, but I could equally put a picture here of the kidney because there is some residual function in the remaining kidney tissue and that gets stunned as well. It also stuns the gut, indeed, uh, Removing fluid too rapidly reduces the blood volume. 
if you reduce the blood volume, you reduce the perfusion pressure because the blood pressure drops. And when that happens, you reduce the amount of oxygen that is being delivered to whichever of these tissues you're looking at, be it heart, brain, gut, or whatever. And that causes a concept of stunning. And I think we detail stunning again in a further uh, uh, slide set. The rapid uh, ultrafiltration is the single greatest danger and threat posed to any dialysis patient. So fluid removal is actually more problematic than solute removal, though both matter. This is what heading home after dialysis looks like for the average patient sitting in a particular US short hour uh, infrequent in center dialysis program. Slowing down the dialysis process is absolutely vital. We know that speed kills on the road and speed kills in dialysis. So the object of the exercise in dialysis is to slow down the amount of fluid removal so that the patient remains symptom free and lives better and longer. Good dialysis is all about slow, careful, gentle fluid removal. Volume is a major problem for dialysis patients. As I said a moment ago, uh, urine output is limited or nil in many patients. And in that instance, fluid, any fluid taken in is retained. Rapid weight gain, uh, often two to three kilograms and sometimes significantly more, commonly occurs between treatments. And the more fluid gained, the more has to be removed during the upcoming dialysis treatment to return the patient to what is deemed as their dry weight. And one of the problems, clinical problems in dialysis is we don't assess what we think dry weight should be often enough or well enough. A, a trained clinician can get a pretty good idea of what somebody's dry weight should be but people, we change our body weight significantly. So if you're only uh, assessing a patient once every two or three months, uh, a significant amount of body weight change can occur in that time, which alters the actual uh, um, value for dry weight. So we do need to keep a close eye on what we think the appropriate weight should be for any patient. And dry weight is an unexpanded normovolemic, normal volume cardiovascular system. This all leads patients to climb aboard uh, the, the, what I call the volume seesaw. And I've done this again before, and I, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a crucial sequence to understanding volume. And so I'm going to go through it again at the risk of boring those who have not uh, heard previous sessions. Uh, and there are several of those uh, on this um, slide presentation uh, today. The vicious circle of thirst, weight gain, and too rapid fluid removal. Let's assume that there has been a reasonable amount of excess fluid weight gain. The more that weight gain, the faster one has to remove that fluid to return that patient to dry weight. And if that is done in an all too brief dialysis session, what happens is that we remove fluid from the blood volume too quickly that causes the blood volume to contract. And that's a medical term is called hypovolemia, which just means hypo, low, vol, volume, emia, blood. So hypovolemia means low blood volume. So we, by removing fluid from the blood volume too quickly, 
we cause the blood volume to drop. When the blood volume drops too fast or too far, it causes the blood pressure to crash. What do we do in a dialysis unit when the blood pressure crashes? We give the patient saline resuscitation. So we, there's a, uh, a bag of saline up there and somebody comes along and turns on the, uh, the flow and gives you a bolus dose of 250 or 500 mils of saline to rapidly expand the blood volume to restore the blood pressure and correct that too rapid a removal of fluid that has been the problem in the first place. But what are we doing when we're giving saline uh, in the dialysis unit? We're returning to the patient exactly what we're trying to remove in the first place, which is excess fluid weight gain. So it's a counterproductive exercise to do that. It's a necessary exercise if you have, core, if you have done your dialysis so fast that you have caused the blood pressure to drop in the first place, but it is a counterproductive exercise in terms of what the holistic dialysis process is trying to do. If you induce hypovolemia, a low blood volume, that sends very potent messages to a center in the brain called the thirst center, which is uh, 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 a potent uh, primal uh, reflex, if you like, which in response to a low blood volume says, I must go out and drink. So what happens is the patient at the end of that too fast, too rapid ultrafiltration, uh, too brief dialysis session, goes home with their thirst mechanisms turned on and they involuntarily drink. They can't help it. When you're thirsty, you drink. And we have created a monster for that patient by doing a too short, too fast, too brief, uh, too rapid fluid removal dialysis, turning on their thirst center. So what do they do? They go home, they drink, and what, does, what happens between then and the next dialysis session? they gain excess fluid weight. And so we go around in a ever inducing circle. The fallacy here, here is that, well, one of the fallacies is there is no obligation to remove fluid on dialysis. I hear from, particularly from the United States, uh, 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 people or nurses saying, oh, but we must remove 300 mils an hour uh, from the patient. I mean, that's, we have to do that. Indeed, that's not true. There's no obligation to remove any fluid. And indeed, some people who come in for dialysis and they have not gained weight, in fact, they're undervolumed, need to have fluid infused during dialysis. They need to be pumped up rather than pumped down. So uh, this obligation to remove, remove fluid is wrong. This came about some years ago when we moved from low flux dialyzers to high flux dialyzers, and there was fear of a backflow of fluid, and therefore uh, the patient would be exposed to uh, 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 fluid coming in from the dialysate uh, if we didn't obligatorily create a uh, waterfall across the membrane uh, to counter that. Uh, since dialysis uh, uh, water uh, uh, regulations have improved and dialysis membranes have improved, there's no evidence that that is at all necessary. Uh, and so if there's no fluid weight gain, if volume markers are normal, then nothing says you must remove fluid, nothing at all. And I, this is just what I've talked about, the origins of the remo must remove fluid concept in the early days when poor water quality was poor, water standards were lax, there was a risk of, thought to be a risk of back diffusion, uh, possibly. Uh, then those days are long gone. And we must, the, the must remove fluid ethos, however, has remained ingrained in the memory and protocols of many dialysis uh, staff and uh, dialysis unit protocols. And unfortunately, that's wrong. So again, slowing down, 
uh, uh, dialysis is essential to avoid uh, speed killing. I think we should be ashamed of ourselves. I really honestly believe that. To our shame, the short dialysis model is the only option that most current dialysis patients are offered and receive. This is centre-based dialysis. I showed this last week, and I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, uh, if you want to see this, you go back, I think, to the very first uh, session we had on how dialysis works. Uh, I think it was, la or was it last week? I don't remember which, or last time. But these four graphs show the differences between conventional dialysis uh, in terms of solute peaks and troughs and mean solute levels compared with six day a week short daily dialysis, uh, where we're looking at uh, maybe a couple of hours, six days a week, same total number of membrane contact time as here, compared to six day, we can look at this graph here uh, for conventional, this graph for short daily, and this graph here for uh, six night a week nocturnal. This one was meant to be alternate night nocturnal and I put the wrong graph in. Um, these are very useful graphs to look at. And if you go back to one of the previous sessions, you'll be able to look at those in some detail. And they are correctly put there. I'll fix that up later on, Dory. Uh, I'm sorry about that. If we look at short hour, low frequency dialysis, conventional in center, we've said this before, uh, the PAP that's served up by uh, to most dialysis center patients, short, brutal, symptom riddled dialysis, dialysis tailor made to be inadequate, uh, with the least membrane contact time being in the US, uh, Australia and Japan even perhaps a little bit more than Australia. Uh, this is what is done in center. If we look at uh, long hours, low frequency dialysis, this is uh, uh, often the model of uh, nocturnal in center which is usually done three days a week, which means it doesn't exclude you from the uh, exposure to the long break, but it does give you more membrane contact hours because you're looking at some, let's say eight hours, three times a week, uh, up to perhaps 20, 25, between 20 and 25 hours uh, a week. And that's certainly better in terms of uh, solute removal. It's also better in terms of fluid removal because you're doing much slower, longer dialysis. But you do still get that uh, 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 excess period of time in these uh, in-center programs because they're usually slated around uh, a three-time week program and not an alternate uh, uh, night program. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, commonly in-center overnight nocturnal longer duration encourages deeper compartmental cleaning. Uh, the model works for deep solute cleansing, but still fails to optimally manage volume because of the exposure to that uh, long break over the weekend um, uh, uh, because of the inadequate frequency. In center nocturnal dialysis is better, but only uh, by half the long gaps between treatments still permit large fluid gains, the more hours without dialysis, more time to drink uh, and uh, excess uh, fluid volume gained. Uh, patients with residual urine output, however, benefit more than those who are anuric uh, or have no urine output. And while a longer sessional duration can permit a slower ultrafiltration rate, this benefit is effectively canceled, particularly after the long break, break by a larger accumulated volume to remove. Then we turn to short hour uh, high frequency dialysis, which largely typifies the of the US centric short daily hemodialysis model. We don't do that here. We don't do short daily hemodialysis in Australia. Uh, it's not a model that we've ever embraced, uh, uh, but it is, I think uh, you can, some of your patients, the patients can correct me if I have this wrong, but I think it is what is uh, predominantly performed uh, in the United States and particularly in the home patients. 
Uh, it's short daily hemodialysis, five to six treatments a week, but often those treatments are only two to maybe three hours uh, in duration. Uh, probably the membrane contact time over a week is a little longer uh, than you get in conventional dialysis, uh, but uh, it's not what I would call optimal uh, hemodialysis. Short daily hemodialysis trades off shorter treatments against more of them. So you do five or six treatments a week, but you can cut back. Well, I think you shouldn't cut back, but people do cut back their hours uh, down to three or even two and a half hours uh, at a time. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, uh, a poor, bad, uh, minimal gain uh, for uh, not much uh, benefit. So it still doesn't provide the wisest and most appropriate answer. If you look at solute removal in a short daily program, High frequency dialysis benefits small solute clearance. So short daily uh, dialysis, uh, that sort of two and a half to three hours, uh, five, five times, six times a week is useful because you're getting a whole heap of these small, large removal um, uh, sessions of dialysis. So it, provides a maximal gradient for small solute clearance uh, and is a gradient dependent removal pattern. But if you take middle molecules and phosphate again, remember has its hydrophilic water uh, heavy skin, uh, which is removed by linear uh, removal. If you do only short daily dialysis, let's say arguably, and I know this is probably a bit on the short side, uh, two hours, uh, six times a week, you're only getting that times six uh, in terms of removal of dialysis in a week. Uh, and that is a poor return in terms of middle molecular clearance. So short hour high frequency dialysis clears small solutes well. That's true, but it does not significantly improve large solute clearance, which means that short daily dialysis, like its name, comes up short. If you look at volume control in short daily programs, high frequency dialysis reduces the period available for interdialytic fluid accumulation. So if you're doing dialysis, uh, let's say six times a week, uh, you've only got a day to drink and, and you're dialyzing again. You've got a day to drink and you're dialyzing again. So the frequency, high frequency, reduces the, the, the drinking period. But if you combine short treatment times, with high frequency dialysis, although you may have less time to drink, you've also, because of your shorter dialysis treatment time, got less time to ultrafilter. So in fact, your ultrafiltration rate often remains essentially unchanged because although you've accumulated less fluid, you're dialyzing for a short period of time. So in that short period of time, you've still got to remove uh, at a significant volume removal rate. So volume removal above all needs time. And time is the only universal constant I'm aware of that can't be abbreviated. So you can't reduce time unless, well, even Einstein couldn't do that. Long hours and higher frequency dialysis or intensive, high intensity, extended hour dialysis or extended hour and frequency dialysis, which was uh, developed initially in Canada by Uldahl and Pieratis. That, that's not entirely true. And if Nancy uh, is uh, on today, I don't know whether she is, she would uh, uh, berate me by saying, indeed, this is what uh, was done back in the early days uh, in Seattle uh, by Scribner's group uh, prior to 1972, when all sorts of things started to go wrong in the United States, and also by Stanley Sheldon uh, in the United Kingdom. Thank you for that. 
so yes, they were, when I say it was first developed by Uldan and Pieratus, in its modern form, that is true. Uh, and later on, Bob Lockridge and myself took these, uh, this uh, Canadian program of nocturnal dialysis, and at that time it was uh, eight hours, six times, six times a week, uh, to the US and Australia and New Zealand, and that's what certainly our team continues to do. It delivers not only optimal solute clearance, but it also allows gentle volume correction, because you've got long uh, uh, hours on dialysis, that means you get off more middle molecules, uh, as well as small, and you've got long hours and high frequency, which means you haven't got much time to gain excess fluid, and you've got a long time on dialysis to remove it in. Uh, this is commonly done at home, where it's known as home nocturnal, and commonly runs between seven and nine hours, uh, four to six nights a week, and as I say, that's what we do. Home nocturnal dialysis provides deep compartmental cleaning because of long sessional duration. It allows for lower filtration, ultrafiltration rate because a shorter accumulation period for fluid off dialysis or in between dialysis and a longer sessional dura duration in which to remove that smaller volume accumulated, which means a very low and gentle ultrafiltration rate. While an alternate nightly option has become popular in Australia and New Zealand, this too always avoids a long break. And what I mean by alternate night option, this is doing uh, say eight hours, eight or nine hours uh, every second night. Uh, and that was the graph that I had uh, 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 incorrectly not included in that group of four that I showed you earlier on in the presentation. So time and frequency matter for both target domains. Clearly longer and more frequent dialysis makes sense. And as for the two key domains, solute and uh, volume, uh, the key variable for solute clearance is duration, though a longer interdialytic volume uh, period also allows for uh, um, uh, greater solute accumulation. And the key variable for volume management is sessional frequency though clearly the shorter the treatment time, the higher the ultrafiltration rate for any given volume. So the final question is what matters most? Is it solute or volume? Well, I strongly believe volume beats solute. Volume is the cardiovascular bete noire. Dialysis morbidity and mortality is primarily driven by either or both of an excessive load of volume accumulation and an excessive speed of volume contraction on dialysis. This is the interdialytic volume accumulation, fluid accumulation, weight gain. This is the ultrafiltration speed uh, of, uh, vo uh, of volume contraction during dialysis. Rationalizing this, I reckon F beats T uh, probably by a whisker, but I think it wins. And now the last word comes back to, uh, to the two giants, I think, of 20th century dialysis. Uh, one was a giant of hemodialysis, building Scribner, and the other, uh, Dimitri Oriopoulos, was the giant of peritoneal dialysis. And between them, those two gentlemen probably did more for uh, dialysis than any other uh, that I can think of uh, in the history of dialysis, uh, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Well, Scribner and Oreopolis were getting a bit long in the tooth and, and, and around about the uh, turn of the century, they sat down possibly over a wine and possibly on uh, Scribs houseboat uh, in Seattle on uh, uh, Lake Union, I think it is, uh, or, or it was. Uh, and they sat down and said, well, what really matters in dialysis? And they looked at KTV and they said, well, that's crap. Uh, they looked at a whole lot of other things and tossed them out as well. Uh, and they came down, they 
at, at the end probably of a couple of bottles of wine, they ended up with what's called the hemodialysis product. Now, I think rather sadly, the hemodialysis product did not uh, catch on uh, because it was uh, a synthesis of wisdom from these two uh, giants of dialysis. They had no, one of the problems uh, is that nowadays you have to have uh, study after study after study after study to, uh, uh, to underpin uh, any concept. Uh, this they just dreamt up. Uh, there were no studies. Uh, there were no uh, uh, randomized controlled trials uh, to show that the hemodialysis product meant something. But sadly, and of course it did. These two undisputed giants, giants ended their extraordinary careers by pondering what makes good dialysis. They proposed the hemodialysis product. After a lifetime of searching for that answer, they settled on time and frequency. These were the only two things that they felt mattered in good dialysis. The hemodialysis product, in simple terms, came down to a Again, a mathematical construct, but if you could, I should really have to compare here the construct of KTV and show you what that looks like. It's horrendous. But they said, all you've got to do is multiply time by frequency squared. Now, that's an interesting thing that they squared frequency, but they did. And I might mention that again in a moment. So if you take the hours per session, that's T, and the number of sessions per week, that's F, and you square F, so that's three times three, which is nine, your hemodialysis product was three times nine equals 27. They believed that was totally inadequate and associated with severe malnutrition and lots of other things. Let's take now four sessions a week, sorry, four hours a week, uh, if you like standard conventional hemodialysis, again times nine, because remember we're squaring the dialysis sessions. So four, that gives you 36 hours. And so on and so on and so on. Looking at the number of hours per session, and the number of times per week. If we go down to the final one, remember six is squared. So six sixes, I can't work that out. I think it's 36, uh, gives you a figure of 288. So uh, we'll take one in the middle. Here is uh, five hours of dialysis a week, four times a week. So four fours are 16, so five 16s are 80. So the hemodialysis product then is a construct between the hours per week times the sessions squared. And all you have to do is know how long are, uh, are your dialysis sessions and how often a week are you accessing dialysis and that will give you a number. And the bigger that number, the better your dialysis. And that was uh, a, the most simplistic view of a an, an method to look at, at dialysis that I think has ever been constructed, but I think it's a ripper. And unfortunately, uh, we, it, it wasn't adopted or it, it was printed in a journal called Dialysis and Transplantation, which had been um, a significant dialysis journal uh, through the first 30 to 40 years of dialysis uh, uh, existence. But it was really reaching its last legs by uh, the turn of the century. And in fact, uh, I think it went out of, of uh, print somewhere around about 2004 or 2005. And they published in Dialysis and Transplantation, uh, which by that stage was a journal very few people were reading. And I think it kind of disappeared underneath the waves. And the reason they published in that particular journal was because they didn't have RCTs and uh, detailed research trials to uh, underpin their concept. And of course, 
no reputable journal would have taken their paper. I, I, I mean that in, in, in inverted commas, uh, because um, uh, one of the problems I think with literature nowadays is it doesn't give the opportunity for thoughtful presentation, which doesn't necessarily, and argument and debate, which doesn't necessarily have a lot of research underpinning it. And, and unfortunately, if you'd presented, um, if Scribner and uh, Oriopolis had presented their paper to say, the New England Journal of Medicine, Kidney International, uh, C. Jason or any of those others, they would have uh, tossed it straight out uh, because it, there was no research underpinning it. It was just uh, over wine coming up with what was a very uh, astute, careful and sensible concept. You'll notice that they squared F or frequency. They weighted frequency over time, although they determined that both mattered and both were all that mattered. So I'm not sure whether squaring is correct. Uh, I'd love to be able to do some work on this to see what in fact uh, the, the, the true weighting of F against T. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, by squaring F, I, I suspect they have overemphasized frequency, uh, though if they had given it equal value to T, they may have undervalued it. So F probably matters more than T, but by a whisker. So perhaps the truth lies somewhere in between. In terms of my view, one thing is certain. Time and frequency uh, is all that matters. Uh, and all the rest is simply noise. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. And I hope that you have followed that uh, rather rambly uh, presentation through uh, time and volume. Thanks, Dory. Thank you, John. There is uh, one question so far from Michael Morales. I just wanted to say, um, Michael is a friend. He is a technician by training and he has a technician training school and he invited a number of technicians to be here tonight, which I appreciate very much. And they are learning from you, but I also want them to learn from the, the, um, the folks on dialysis who are here. So his question, again, which might be to you or might be to others, in this session, what are the morbidity, mortality, quality of life benefits if ample time is given for solute clearance and volume removal? Well, certainly that volume removal, uh, that, that's a talk in itself. Uh, to, both of those are talks in themselves, to be honest. Um, in terms of volume removal, uh, I, I think, um, I, I always go back to Carl uh, uh, Kellstrand's Killer Weekend uh, as being a, a great uh, example of uh, what happens when you have that extra time for volume accumulation and solute accumulation. So uh, if you look at the, at the dialysis literature, and, and there's a, a multitude of papers that show this. It's not just Carl's. Carl was the first one, to, I think, uh, to, to give it a name and call it the killer weekend um, and draw attention to it. But there are many others, uh, particularly some of the Canadians who have uh, looked at this in some detail. But your chances of dying uh, or having major um, uh, morbidity events or symptoms on your dialysis, uh, whatever you like to look at, uh, on the dialysis or the day, the, the first dialysis of the week, which is after the long break over the weekend. So if you're on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, regimen, for example, then your chances of dying on the Sunday night before Monday's dialysis or during Monday's dialysis because of the more rapid removal of fluid that has to, that commonly occurs in that dialysis uh, or uh, the more rapid removal and changes in, for example, blood potassium or whatever it might be, 
that occur in that dialysis because of the accumulation of fluid and solute, your chances of dying on your Monday dialysis are something like twice the chance of you dying uh, on your Wednesday dialysis or your Friday dialysis. And the same occurs if you're on a Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, your chances of dying on the Monday night or during the Tuesday dialysis are about twice that of your other two dialyses of the week. Um, the, the, and, and it's not just dying, uh, uh, it's also your uh, morbidity, the, the symptoms you get on dialysis and so on. That also raises the question of titrating things like titrating volume for people who are on uh, three times a week dialysis with a long break. Do you actually need to restore that person's volume to dry weight on the Monday dialysis? And the answer is no. So what we should be doing is if you are locked into a three times a week dialysis, the first dialysis of the next week, in other words, the first dialysis after the long break, should be a kind of three quarters dialysis in terms of fluid removal and solute removal. You don't have to remove it all on the first one. And then the next one a bit more and the next one a bit more. So if you actually uh, slowly uh, uh, gradually graduate the removal of, of volume and, sol and, 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 and solute, that is probably better. Do I have any uh, chapter and verse on that? No, because there's not much data in terms of people doing that sort of um, uh, gradated dialysis uh, uh, in three times a week dialysis programs. But uh, I, I haven't answered, the, probably haven't answered the question for Michael, but uh, they're, they're the sorts of things that I would uh, suggest he goes and looks at. Uh, John, and the first thing to do is look at killer weekends. Um, and I, I have those data, Michael, if you want them. But I asked Nancy and Henning and Linda to unmute and Stephen because they have experienced the difference between nocturnal dialysis and standard dialysis. And so I thought it might be good for Michael to hear from them. So um, maybe one at a time. Um, Nancy, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Um, <clears throat> when I started dialysis in 1966, the only thing we did was nocturnal. And I did it at home overnight. I was able to get up in the morning and finish college. And then I was able to get up in the morning and go to, to work because we didn't have Medicare yet. And I had to work for insurance. <laughs> but I um, I really preferred the overnight dialysis. I felt better. My diet was better. Um, it was just way better than four hours. I just hated four hours. Even when I did it at home, I didn't like it because I'd have to get off in the evening and go to bed. So I felt the very, very best doing nocturnal. Um, at home. I mean, that's why I, uh, I raised Sydney Sheldon and, and Belding Scribner's early work because uh, when I trained in uh, 1970, started training, did my first rotation in uh, uh, nephrology in 1971, graduated in 1970, did my first rotation in 71, uh, it was into a, uh, an eight to 10 hour, three times a week dialysis. Uh, uh, program. We were doing here in, uh, in Melbourne, in the first unit I ever worked in, in 1971, we were doing nocturnal dialysis. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why uh, and nocturnal dialysis and home dialysis uh, 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 died, uh, or close to died, uh, in that time. Uh, which I'm not going to go into now, but you're quite right, uh, Nancy, that was exactly what uh, the early days of dialysis were all about. Um, and it was so much better, so, so much better. Um, and Dr. Scribner was my doctor. And the other thing he taught me was to keep my sodium under a thousand milligrams a day. And I still do that today, even with my transplant. So I don't have Any? to take blood pressure medicine. Henning, anything to add? Me? Yep. 
Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sleeping here. It's only like two two fifteen in the morning or something like that. Oh, well, right. Sorry, you're you're not quite right because I only did internal dialysis while I was planning to go home. I was thinking about um, that that you didn't have much experience with in center, but um, I think you had. Ever, a I will say, my all my international travel, <laughs> all my my intercontinental travel, has definitely taught me what the long break means like 36 to 48 hours between sessions and i'm just i mean i i feel horrible for a few days after that happened so i've tried something similar just in a different way there you go i, I would uh, uh emphasize that by saying that in our nocturnal program um one of the real problems that nocturnal patients face um uh, particularly in australia is is travel uh, and being able to go away on holidays. Uh, and they, oh, we'll take a holiday. We'll go up to, to, I don't know, Queensland and have a holiday. Unfortunately, when they do that, they have to book into a, a centre-based program to support their uh, dialysis needs while they're up there for two or three weeks on their holiday. Uh, most of those holidays are brought sh uh, 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 shortened because the patient feels so horrible that all they want to do is come home to their nocturnal program because they feel terrible on the short uh, uh, conventional dialysis that they're locked into while they're there on holiday. Obviously, that brings into uh, sharp focus things like uh, portability of dialysis, and that's a different, whole different uh, uh, talk, and I, I don't want to get bogged down in that at the moment, except to use that example to support what Henning says uh, about the, 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 the chalk and cheese between uh, short centre-based dialysis and long home-based nocturnal. I know Stephen has some things he, if, assuming he's still awake, because it's after midnight there, that, that he might like to say about uh, nocturnal versus standard. Yeah, hi, okay. So I'm, I am on nocturnal, as you can see, I'm on, on treatment right now. It's uh, a little after one in the morning here. Um, <clears throat> I've been on uh, nocturnal treatment for just about six weeks now, and the difference between uh, daytime treatment and nighttime treatment is remarkable. I've not worked for four years, and I've just applied for a job this week. Oh, um, that's wonderful. So, because I feel able to do it. The difference for me is just phenomenal. Uh, I've just got so much one night of the week, week, it's not good, is Tuesday nights every second week when we keep you up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I can. I've got nothing in my diary for tomorrow. It's going to be a long lie-in. Um, so yeah. So, it, but I genuinely feel so much better, um, and my blood results are stunningly different. Even the small molecule differences. Uh, um, my creatinine levels were um, when I was on in unit. It was they were above a thousand. Um, since I got home and I was doing three hours, six days a week, it dropped to around 500. Uh, so, sorry, it dropped to, to around 750. And now that I'm on nocturnal, my creatinine levels are down below 500. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm staggered by the difference in my blood results and my energy levels. Uh, and and the quality of my... probably go between about 120 and, one, and, and 450 yeah. one, in that range. Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, very it, quickly, Stephen. I'm a Hewitt too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've spoken, Nancy. We've spoken in the past just on Messenger. Yeah, <laughs> and I just want to say that we never called it nocturnal, we just yeah. called it dialysis. That's all yeah. we had. It was just dialysis. Nocturnal is a new term. <laughs> Any other questions, Dory? I was going to let uh, Linda respond as well. I think oh, Linda, I think you do nocturnal, but I could be wrong about that. I've I've never done nocturnal. I lied. I've asked my plenty I of all the <laughs> and I was told I couldn't do it without a partner, uh, which yes. makes absolutely no sense. Robin, they're not going to sleep with me. They're not going to stay awake. <laughs> The other bedroom in the house is on the total opposite side of the house. They wouldn't hear any alarms. But 
if I wanted to do it, I would fight them and I would be the first to do solo nocturnal in my clinic, just like I was the first to do solo hemo. Um, but I don't sleep well. Mm. And I can't imagine trying to stay hooked up to a machine and trying to sleep. Even when I was going to do PD, I, had, I wasn't able to, but when I was going to do PD, it was going to be half the time on the cycler and half the time doing manuals so that I could get some sleep some nights. But talking, about I, chick comment, talking about chick comments and what uh, Linda said, uh, it comes down to sleep and carers. Uh, you're right about sleep. Uh, there are some patients who do not sleep well on dialysis. We find that that's the minority uh, by a long way. Most people do sleep well on dialysis. I, I accept that some don't, and particularly early on in the process, uh, in their first few weeks, they will find that it, it takes a while to trust your machine to, uh, to to get used to the noises and the little squeaks and the uh, the things it does, and uh, maybe the, one night a week or one night a, uh, every now and then that you get an alarm, which is usually a kinked line alarm, uh, and some people. Uh, are just are, are never quite able to get over that hump of, of uh, trusting their machine or uh, for other reasons just don't sleep well. But the, uh, but you don't you, sleep it's well. Not common. It, the majority do do that. The second now, thing I don't sleep well, period. I've right. never slept well in my entire life. And so the idea of. We'd probably drug you. Sleep, <laughs> I'd drug you. It doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, I suggest a dram of um, uh, West uh, West Coast uh, Scotch uh, before you go to bed. <laughs> It'll probably do you the world of good. I, I I haven't tried Scotch, but I've certainly tried alcohol. Well, anyone will tell you that you should. <laughs> well, I've tried melatonin. I've tried Ambien a couple times. That doesn't. That's no. scary. Scotch um, is much nicer. But uh, the other comment that I would make is around carers and, and this business of requiring a carer uh, for somebody who is sleeping uh, on nocturnal and doing six or eight, particularly eight hours a, a night, the, the rate of ultrafiltration is so slow that the usual things that frighten uh, dialysis professionals are the drop in blood pressure. That's the big issue that people get their knickers in a knot over is that, uh, oh, what happens if your blood pressure drops? Uh, who's going to be there to turn on the, the, the saline and revive you? The whole concept is that the, the blood pressure doesn't drop and therefore you don't run into problems of hypovolemia and you don't need somebody there to turn on the saline and the alarms that go off are almost all low pressure uh, alarms because you've rolled over and you've kinked the line and all you've got to do is push mute, shake your arm, push go and away you go again. And that the chances of that happening are commonly less uh, uh, than one a night. So uh, all of uh, and, and so all of that can be managed by the patient. And and the uh, the, the need for a carer in home nocturnal dialysis uh, is just plain wrong. It's not necessary. It's not needed. Uh, and but it 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 scares the pants off most professionals who are trained to think in exactly the opposite way. And so unless you have experience with uh, home nocturnal, uh, you get frightened. It's not you that gets frightened. It's the, it's the professional who's looking after you who gets frightened. It's, it's, the, it's the corporate lawyers. Um, yeah. they, they, for the they company certainly, that, the, that's, that's my the training part. nurse was absolutely against me doing solo dialysis. And she asked me, what would happen if your blood pressure dropped and you passed out? And I said, well, if I passed out and didn't come to, I'd probably die. <laughs> so what? And yeah. is that yeah. worth your independence? Probably. That's yeah. what I said. <laughs> yeah. The risks um, John... are we do. So um, uh, whether it's crossing the road, going down the street, or dialyzing through the night, there are risks. Uh, I do you know, to dialysis. If you're prepared to accept those risks, and uh, and but 
but the risk of your blood pressure dropping in long, slow dialysis is essentially zero. Yeah. And I don't remove fluids anyway. So I've had, in six years of dialysis, I've had one episode of hypotension. And it was after I got off the machine. I was on my way out of the center. And I didn't pass out. I just felt a little woozy. So I sat down, put my head between my legs. And the nurse came over and checked my blood pressure. And it was 80. I said, you know, give me some salty crackers. I'll be fine. Um, never have had another episode like that. I had a question but, for you. Any Jenny. thoughts, Penning? What's up? Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say regarding um, nocturnal and, and poor sleep. I actually think that nocturnal improves your sleep pattern after a while. And I think that's, it's not just getting used to it. I also think something happens in the body. Whatever is removed better actually improves your sleep pattern. I, I do believe that. I have no proof whatsoever. I agree you with know, that. And Henning, I got to agree with you, uh, and I don't do nocturnal yet, but when I, I call it the Zen moment, but about 20 minutes into dialysis, if you have that right co combination of UFR and blood flow and everything, I call it my Zen moment, and I literally feel like I'm going into a coma. It's so relaxing, and I, I, I really hope that patients can strive for that, like I call it a set point. Um, and, you know, because I think if they could, then they would really be able to get the most out of their treatments. You know, you say that, and I think relaxing said no in-center patient ever. I know. Um, I, had a, I had a question for John, which is, in Australia, are they using plastic cannulas for nocturnal hemo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, see, that's a huge... Oh, what a great thing. Because we are, we don't want to pay the extra three or four dollars for those plastic cannulas, and everybody's using steel needles. Yeah. And so it's a much scarier prospect to try to sleep with steel needles in your arm than it is with those plastic cannulas, which are made for nocturnal. They're perfect for it. For a dialysis program, uh, um... Nocturnal dialysis programs or nocturnal dialysis in a, a program of, of some size, which ours clearly is, um, uh, it takes, you need about 10 patients in your program to actually begin to see, and I have to keep coming back to the concept of cost, but uh, the, the cost of home hemodialysis drops progressively after you reach about 10 patients in your program. So if you've got a, post, a program like we have with 50 odd patients at home, uh, the, the cost of uh, nocturnal dialysis or home dialysis uh, is around about a th two thirds that of, of center-based programs. And I think Dora, you'll know that there are a, a plethora of papers in the literature which uh, look at that and show that figure of about uh, somewhere between 25 and 35, 33% uh, reduction in overall costs for home dialysis versus centre-based dialysis because the patient is their own nurse. Uh, you're not paying nursing. You're not paying uh, infrastructure of building dialysis units or putting in computers and all of that sort of stuff. So uh, you have no infrastructure uh, and, nurse, uh, and, and staffing costs. And that's where you make you make a gain in terms of overall cost of the program. So if you're going to use plastic cannulae that cost uh, an extra couple of bucks uh, over a steel cannula uh, over the course of a 12 month period per patient is minuscule, uh, right. a minuscule additional expense yeah. relative to the maximal reduction in overall costs that home dialysis allows you. So, I mean, that cost uh, argument is, is also, to be honest, is crap. Because you've got to look at it uh, holistically and not just say, oh, that's a very expensive cannula. Look at your total costs and see uh, how much it costs to run a patient at home versus an incentive patient. Uh, it's a no-brainer. I think Stephen <coughs> had something else to add. Yeah, we just 
kind of back, back a second or two with regards to the, the issue of sleeping. Um, I'm, uh, like I say, I'm only six weeks into this. I'm not sleeping brilliantly. Uh, but I've identified that the, the, the problem for me is the noise, and the noise is from the Aqua Uno water treatment plant, water softening plant. And I've just asked my technician if he can just create a noise deadening box that I can yes. put over, over it as a shield. And that would yes. make it, you know, you sound deadening. As knows, we had a, 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 one of our home patients we actually went into business making um, hmm. uh, noise, uh, 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 noise reduction boxes, which placed over the the, yeah. the RO. Alternatively, we try where we can to put the RO in a separate room and yeah. bore a little hole for the water pipes through the wall so that the uh, RO is, is separate from the sleeping area. Uh, that's another way around doing it. So there are all sorts of ways in which you can noise deaden your RO. And I would encourage you to look into um, uh, all of those uh, and you know, get out and do some home carpentry, buy some decent uh, fluffy carpet and line the inside of the box with carpet and you're home and hosed. Yeah, um, that's exactly my thought process. Kyle had a question. He wanted to know, how is the prep for new patients to convince them on the slower and more frequent dialysis over the quick and short done in your country? Dr. Agar, I often hear patients complaining about the amount of time to spend in their daily or weekly lives on dialysis, even on the three times a week. Well, see, we do dialysis while you're asleep. Uh, we've, we've had a discussion about sleep, uh, and uh, uh, given that there are some patients who have difficulty with sleeping, we find most don't. Uh, so. Uh, you're dialyzing in your downtime. So you're putting yourself on at night, let's say at uh, uh, 10 o'clock at night, takes you, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour to get yourself on or whatever it is. And then uh, maybe 20 minutes in the morning to take yourself off again. And the rest of your day is, is free. You're not going to the dialysis unit. You're not uh, um, uh, spending your days thinking about dialysis. You're actually spending your days thinking about uh, being Kyle Chang and living your life in Singapore. So um, uh, this concept of, of uh, taking away your life from you by doing long overnight dialysis is actually uh, 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 also wrong. You're actually giving somebody back their life by allowing them to have a day where they can go to work. Stephen can apply for a job uh, because he knows he's, he's got uh, every day to go and do it. So uh, uh, that's the first comment I would make. In terms of um, uh, attracting people into nocturnal dialysis, uh, once you have an ethos, an ethic uh, uh, in your unit of uh, this is the best form of dialysis, home dialysis is your, uh, is your, uh, is your go-to dialysis. Uh, Centre-based dialysis is your fallback, not the other way around, which is what it is in most systems where oh, you're all going to go to centre-based dialysis and maybe one or two of you, if you're very lucky and if the unit uh, has got the balls to actually train you for uh, nocturnal dialysis, uh, some of you may go home. That's entirely the wrong approach. The third thing that we do here is uh, we've introduced now uh, for, uh, uh, we've had a, a, now for about two or three years, transitional care units, which means that every dialysis patient starts in a transitional care unit. That means that when you first need dialysis, you've, you've uh, negotiated your uh, CKD journey uh, to the point where it's time you need to start dialysis. You go not to a, a, an in-centre unit of three times four or three times four and a half or five, whatever it might be, you go to a transitional care unit. Now the transitional care unit happen, should be, happens to be, ought to be located in your home, in, in, uh, co-located with your home training unit. So that when you start dialysis, you go to the home training unit where the nurses are home training nurses, where the, most of the patients are training for home and you're the newbie, the new person who's starting out on dialysis, uh, but you're dialyzing in a milieu 
of uh, home friendly, home training, uh, home patients coming in to pick up their supplies, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and you see, oh, look, all these people are, uh, are either home, home already or they're training for home. Maybe I can do that. And the nursing staff also uh, bleed that into you over the first four weeks. So you go to a, a transitional care unit for, say, four weeks, and I'm just picking for you four weeks as a, an example. And in that four weeks, you're being... Uh, your first dialysis experience is with somebody who has got home at the front of their head, uh, uh, patients who are home and uh, surrounding you, and it rubs off. So at the end of that four week time, we say, well, um, what do you want to do now? You can go to the, you know, we'd, we'd like you to go home. We think you could go home. We think we could train you for home. Some people will not manage that, clearly. I mean, some people are not going to be able to manage at home. And after that period of time, they will go off to the uh, centre uh, for their centre-based care. But many patients who would perhaps otherwise not have thought it possible will have seen the training milieu for home dialysis in a way that they can think, well, it doesn't look that hard. I could do this. And that's how we do it, Carl. Right. Do you have any blind patients in, in your unit doing home dialysis? Yes, we've, we've had two um, uh, who have done their, and, and self-needled, amazing. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, uh, Steve was one, oh, one, I, one I remember well. He was on home dialysis and, and he's now transplanted, but he was uh, on di home dialysis for some 10 years uh, and uh, self-needled. He was a diabetic who was uh, 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 blind as a result of his diabetic eye disease. Uh, so yes, it, absolutely. Uh, you can do things like have alarms, uh, not, uh, and the same occurs with deaf people. Uh, you have a, an alarm that buzzes, that, that vibrates, and because they can't hear the bing bong or whatever it might be, you convert that into a, uh, a, a sensory alarm, a buzzer, a buzzer alarm. So uh, there are ways around pretty much all problems when you think about them. I asked my training nurse how she would train a blind patient to do solo hemodialysis at home. And she said it wasn't possible. No, it is possible. It made me so mad. I know it may not work for a lot of people, but I knew it was possible. What, when I, what, what when sighted I, people don't, don't realize is that blind people have heightened touch so that uh, uh, what you and I might not really pick out as a vein on the arm, they can feel that vein. Uh, they, there's other senses uh, are uh, um, upregulated, if you like, to compensate for the fact that they're no longer uh, able to see. All sorts of things like that. So I, I interrupted you, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, I was just really angry. When I was a PD nurse, we had patients who were blind and wanted to do their own PD. And we, I don't know how many we ended up getting home able to do it, but we certainly looked into what was available and how we could do it. I was inpatient, so it, you know we didn't train the patients, but when a patient wanted to do it, we worked with the outpatient unit. We figured out how to do it for them. For and PD, there are uh, uh, devices that allow you to do no touch connection. Uh, and you clip the lines in and the, the, the machine actually does the connection for you. So there are all sorts of ways around that. Very yeah, I, I knew it was possible. I was really angry with her for not it. Just try and think about what you would do. I mean, what, I'm really rural, and there probably aren't a lot of blind patients trying to get on home hemo. 
there was only five in the entire unit. Who I think the, uh, the other thing I would make comment about is training and, and uh, um, but people train differently. Some people like to have a written manual uh, and they can go down and read the manual, all the steps, da 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 da, da. Other people train um, best by, uh, by audio, so you can make a tape that, allow, that, te that talks them through the process. Other people like to have visuals, so you can make a book with pictures that actually uh, 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 takes them visually through the training process. So you need to actually look at individual patients and and see how they as individuals uh, best assimilate knowledge and then structure your training program that allow and we've got we've got uh, we, we cater for all of those uh, visual audio and uh, and written so some people get a manual some people get uh, picture books whatever it is uh, whatever floats the, their boat in terms of being able to uh, learn and understand, and that's the way you need to do things. Forget the hands-on learners, John. Sorry? Don't forget the hands-on learners. There are yes. people who need to have it in their hands in order to learn yeah. it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, John, did you want to make any sort of final wrap-up comments? Not really. Uh, it is time to wrap up, and uh, or past time, probably. Uh, but thank you for coming. Uh, that's the first thing to say. I hope uh, these sessions uh, give you something. Uh, unfortunately, they do tend to be um, cumulative. So uh, when, if you're telling others, oh, this is worthwhile, uh, you ought to get on board and come and, and, and be part of the program, uh, you ought to also say, well, you're coming in on number four in the series or whatever it is, which will be the next one. Uh, there are three previous ones. You can go back to Dory's site and look at those and play those through in your own time. And people who are on dialysis often have that kind of time because they're sitting on their machine. They've got their computer in front of them. They may as well become educated uh, as uh, look at the next, next Netflix uh, uh, death and destruction. So, uh, Spread the, if you think these are worthwhile, tell other people that they're, uh, they're on. Uh, we are having them, ever, I think, still every second week for, uh, uh, there are 11 of them, so that's going to be nearly uh, six months worth. And um, uh, th uh, yeah, thank you for coming. I hope that you found those beneficial. Thank you. Uh, and thank finally, you. the final word I would say is, if you have any uh, comments, and I don't mind you being uh, super critical of me if you think I've stuffed up or um, uh, said something that's, that's wrong, uh, please let Dory know uh, so that we can feed that back into the program. For example, uh, I think it was Fez, uh, who's not here today, but uh, was last time, uh, picked up on one of my slides where I had made a, uh, uh, an error. Uh, it was a... a, a innocent error, but it was an error, uh, and we've now been able to correct that. So uh, please let us know if you see something that doesn't quite gel for you, and if we can do it better, we'll try and do it better. Thank you.